Hello friends, my name is JJ. So, despite being one of YouTube's leading Canada explainers, or Tansplainers, for a long time I have avoided making a video on one of my most requested topics, the Canadian healthcare system. And the main reason why I haven't done this is because I wanted to find a way to talk about the system that wasn't just a dry summary of facts. Because Canadian healthcare isn't just a public policy, it's a symbol, a legend, a political debate, and a cultural identity. But now, I think I have a good opening to engage with all of that in the form of Ontario Premier Doug Ford's recent attempts to make reforms to how healthcare works in his province, a reform agenda that has been characterized by his critics as privatization or Americanization, which are two of the scariest charges you can make in Canadian politics when it comes to healthcare. And this has struck me as a bit ridiculous because I do not think that this is what Ford is doing at all. But it is also an illustration of just how defensive much of this country gets about healthcare and how difficult the status quo is to reform even in the face of mounting challenges. And I thought it might be interesting to explore the roots of all of this in a video that I like to call the controversy of Canadian healthcare. So Canada's healthcare system is primarily based around one thing, public health insurance, which is to say, health insurance run by the government. Insurance, as we all know, is essentially a system in which you continuously pay small reoccurring fees in exchange for your insurance provider footing the bill for some very expensive but unpredictable event that might occur in your future, like say a massive heart attack requiring you to get open heart surgery. The governments of the 13 Canadian provinces and territories each run their own health insurance plan, which the public funds by paying their taxes. Anyone living in a Canadian province is automatically covered by a government-run health insurance plan, and these plans are supposed to cover any medical procedure that the government deems medically necessary. Without getting into too much history, I will just note that this system of government-provided health insurance plans has been the status quo in Canada for around 60 years or so. One could easily argue, in fact, that government-run health insurance has basically overlapped with Canada's entire era of modern medicine, and indeed was created in large part to help Canadians deal with the rising costs of all of the new and expensive medical procedures and technologies that arose in the post-war era, as well as providing Canadian doctors and surgeons with reliable payment for those services. Now, even though public health insurance in Canada is officially provided by the governments of Canada's provinces. In practice, Canada's national government has a pretty big say in how those plans are run. The federal government provides around a quarter of their funding and has also established various national standards that all provincial plans must conform to in order to keep receiving that funding. Basically, the plans have to cover all citizens, they have to be government run, and they have to offer the same standard of coverage across the country, which is to say, coverage for any procedure deemed medically necessary. So far, so clear, hopefully. But hold on to your hats, because the system is not quite so simple in practice. For starters, what exactly is a medically necessary procedure? This really excellent book on Canadian healthcare, Chronic Condition by Jeffrey Simpson, says that government's fiscal interest in only paying for what is medically necessary has resulted in Canadian public health insurance plans being deep, but narrow. The deep part refers to the fact that the plans offer comprehensive coverage for all of the most important surgeries, operations, and treatments required to save lives, fix injuries, or cure a severe illness. Organ transplants, chemotherapy, grafting, bones and skin back together, that sort of thing. Basically, stuff done in hospitals. And since hospitals in Canada also tend to be run by the government, public health care in Canada is overall a very hospital-centric concept. And to be clear, this is also one of the greatest virtues of the system from the perspective of your typical Canadian. Since the treatment one receives from a Canadian hospital is likely to be the most critically important healthcare they receive, 
it is great that government has made guaranteeing access to this sort of treatment such a priority. The narrowness of Canadian public health insurance, however, refers to just how many less pressing medical treatments government plans won't cover, including dentistry, eye stuff, mental health, nursing homes, prescription drugs, over-the-counter medications, and voluntary operations that might improve your health overall, but aren't super pressing, like, say, getting your stomach stapled or something. Most Canadians have private health insurance plans to pay for these sorts of things, which are usually provided by their work as a perk of employment. Unless, of course, you have an unconventional job, like me, in which case you just have to buy private health insurance on your own. Now, obviously, when you give the public unlimited access to a limited resource, like hospital services, there is a persistent danger that there won't be enough for everyone. The only real way to make such a system work is to therefore restrain access to that resource in various ways. And this brings us to one of the most controversial aspects of the Canadian healthcare regime, the degree that hospital treatments and procedures have to be rationed in various ways to ensure they are being distributed to the public in a fair and sustainable manner. The most notorious rationing in the Canadian system takes the form of very long wait times for critically important hospital procedures. There is an outfit called the Fraser Institute, which, depending on where you stand politically, is either a mildly libertarian think tank or a gang of right-wing activists. and. They are famous for churning out these reports documenting how long it takes to receive a medically necessary procedure in a Canadian hospital. Measured from the time a doctor refers a patient to a medical specialist to when the specialist actually performs the procedure, the median wait time in 2022 was said to be 27.4 weeks which is among the longest anywhere in the industrialized world. And as you can see from this chart, it is also a phenomenon that is getting worse as the years go on, as the Fraser people note in their full report. Wait times for medically necessary treatment are not benign inconveniences. Wait times can and do have serious consequences such as increased pain, suffering, and mental anguish. In certain instances, they can also result in poor medical outcomes, transforming potentially reversible illness or injuries into chronic, irreversible conditions or even permanent disabilities. In many instances, patients may also have to forego their wages while they wait for treatment, resulting in an economic cost to the individuals themselves and the economy in general. Now, regardless of where you stand politically, almost everybody seems to agree that wait times are fundamentally a problem of supply. Canada simply does not have enough hospitals and surgeons able to address the medical needs of its population in a timely fashion, especially when that population continues to grow and age, and continuing advancements in medical science mean that we're able to treat more health conditions than ever. This was also something that was brought into sharp focus during COVID, when Canada's hospitals were shockingly overcrowded and short-staffed, despite the fact that Canada had a relatively high vaccination rate. Uh, the public needs to know nurses are being burnt out. They are working anywhere from 84 to 100 plus hours a week. Not bi-weekly, a week. According to the Globe and Mail, even before COVID, Canadian hospitals were generally operating at over 90% capacity, which is also a very extreme statistic by international standards. If a waiting list system is being managed competently enough, then in theory, there is nothing wrong with a hospital operating at max capacity. But COVID proved that the public's healthcare needs are not always predictable. And then there is the additional problem of people just going to the emergency room in an effort to skip the wait list, creating this whole other phenomenon of chronically overcrowded and slow ERs across Canada, which can have significant consequences for public health as well. This all brings us to Doug Ford, the Conservative Prime Minister of Canada's largest province of Ontario. At a press conference the other week, Ford announced that his government is hoping to alleviate some of the pressures on his province's healthcare system by expanding the scope of Ontario's public health insurance plan 
to cover various medically necessary treatments performed at privately run facilities outside Ontario's government-funded hospital system. Whether it's an emergency in the middle of the night or a problem that's been bothering you for years, no matter where you live, we want to connect you to more convenient care closer to home. Reaction was swift and angry, with pundits, politicians, and activists offering all sorts of harsh words, which I shall now provide a sampling of in this attack ad style montage. Doug Ford has made a dramatic step to privatize healthcare in Ontario. He wants to expand American style healthcare by privatizing hospitals and trudging Ontario towards healthcare privatization. His plan is far too dangerous, says the Toronto Star. For profit surgery providers will increase the cost passed on to patients and taxpayers warns the Globe and Mail. Canada's leaders agree. It's time to reject the American-style for-profit healthcare conservatives are pushing. Otherwise, Ford will be the undertaker and universal healthcare will be what's on board. Now, to understand these reactions, which I think are a pretty dishonest characterization of what is actually going on, we have to now talk a bit about the legend of the Canadian healthcare regime as something distinct from how the system actually works in practice. A big problem with Canada's insurance-based public healthcare system is that it encourages the public to not really understand the nuances of where their medical treatment comes from. To much of middle-class Canada, healthcare is simply something free they get from the government, full stop. This, in turn, is seen as something that makes Canada a uniquely virtuous country, possibly even the greatest country in the world. Whenever they do polls on things that make Canadians proudest to be Canadian, healthcare routinely outpolls democracy, the constitution, Canadian history, the flag, literally everything else. Given that there are lots of countries in this world with public health insurance plans of various sorts, this pride might seem a little overblown. But Canadians do not tend to think much about other countries when it comes to national pride. They only think about one country, the United States. I made a whole other award-winning video on the degree that Canadian patriotism is bound up in hatred and fear of the United States, but Suffice it to say, in the standard Canadian middle-class imagination, America is often seen as the hell to Canada's heaven. And one of the ways that Canadians sustain this belief is through a widely held, though simplistic and mean-spirited understanding of how healthcare in the US is imagined to work. Now, the American healthcare system is obviously very unusual and controversial, and this is not the place to do a whole analysis of it. You can watch my pal Knowing Better's video if you're looking for that. But I do feel comfortable in saying that I don't think most Canadians really understand how the American healthcare system works in any great detail. They don't know what Medicare or Medicaid is, or how Obamacare works, or how American health insurance works in general. In fact, a lot of Canadians don't even think that health insurance exists in America at all. Instead, they simply assume that Americans just pay 60 grand out of pocket at a private hospital when they need brain surgery or whatever. This is what American-style healthcare is often taken to mean in casual Canadian conversation. There are many roots to this legend. One is just the common cliche of Americans being this overly capitalistic, money-grubbing people who try to make absolutely everything into an opportunity to turn a profit. Another is the tales of woe from Canadians who travel to America, get sick, and then are faced with these enormous medical bills because they didn't buy traveler's insurance, and then they just go around telling everybody that this is just how things work down there. And then there is the fact that Canadians tend to consume a lot of American media, and the American media tends to put a lot of focus on the plight of uninsured Americans and their crazy medical bills, which again can result in Canadians assuming that this sort of thing is a much more common American experience than it actually is. A lot of American political activists likewise quite openly despise the US healthcare system and play up Canada 
as an enviable alternative, which I think also pumps up Canadian egos and feeds into hostility towards the imagined American alternative. But for the purposes of our discussion, the other thing I want to emphasize is the degree that over the years, private healthcare in Canadian culture has become a term synonymous with American style healthcare, which again is imagined to be this uniquely horrible style of healthcare where patients pay out of pocket for medically necessary procedures. Premier Ford was clearly afraid of his reforms being associated with this line of reasoning, which is why during his press conference, he went out of his way to avoid even using the word private and repeatedly said the following line about OHIP cards, which is the membership card of the Ontario health insurance system. Ontarians will always access healthcare with their OHIP card, never their credit card. They'll be available using your OHIP card, never your credit card. No one is going to be paying any additional cost. They'll never use their credit card. They'll always use their OHIP card. I think the fact that Ford had to be this defensive was a bit pathetic and a sad testament to the degree that he had to assume that voters would have a hard time grasping the concept that public insurance covering privately administered medical procedures is not the same thing as forcing people to pay for those procedures directly. But given how many have accused him of bringing in American style healthcare in the aftermath, his fears seem to have been justified. Even accusing Ford of privatizing healthcare feels wrong in the dictionary sense, since privatizing generally refers to taking a government service and turning it into a private business instead. That's not really happening here, since no existing public hospitals are being turned into private businesses, let alone ones people will have to pay to access. Ontario Public Health Insurance is simply being expanded to cover procedures done at privately run places. What makes all of this even dumber, in my opinion, is the fact that Canadians should really be able to grasp these concepts by now, given that Canadian public health insurance plans already cover a lot of privately administered services and procedures. So Canada is not like England with the NHS, which is an elaborate healthcare service bureaucracy run by the British government. The NHS runs Britain's biggest hospitals and employs most British doctors and nurses and surgeons directly. In Canada, by contrast, things are more of a mix. Hospitals are often run by the government, but most individual Canadian doctors are incorporated as private businesses, and a lot of the downtown or strip mall medical clinics you visit for small problems are private businesses too. Surgeons and other specialists may be privately incorporated as well and just work on a contract basis with a public hospital. The most common estimates usually say that about 30% of all healthcare spending in Canada is private, which is a pretty normal rate for most countries, and one that gives lie to the idea that you sometimes hear that Canadians live under a regime of fully socialized healthcare. But alas, like I said, Canadians tend to conceptualize the idea of public healthcare mostly in terms of what services they can get for free, and don't think a lot about who is actually providing those services. And this ignorant indifference actually seems to be something that Premier Ford is hoping will work to his advantage. People don't care where they have to go as long as it has the same regulations, same top-notch doctors that are working in the hospital that may have some hours to go into another area in different uh, facility. <laughs> Now, there are of course critiques of what Ford is doing that go deeper than just cheap demagoguery against private healthcare. Since private medical facilities are generally in the business of making money, some fear that they might charge the government a lot for their services, which means that even if they help reduce wait times, they will also contribute to the problem of ballooning healthcare spending which is something provincial and federal governments have long struggled to keep under control. Healthcare spending in Canada is sometimes even described as the Pac-Man of Canadian budgets, slowly closing his mouth and squeezing out the amount of money able to be spent on other public services. If private facilities offer better pay for surgeons, 
There is also a fear that this could lure them away from working at public hospitals at all, creating a further rise in costs, as well as potentially pulling qualified practitioners away from small towns and rural communities and such. A more novel criticism that has been coming up a lot lately as well is this idea that private facilities engage in a lot of predatory upselling. Under Canadian law, private facilities are not supposed to allow people to use private insurance or pay out of pocket for any medical services that public insurance covers, which is this whole other debate. But as we discussed earlier, there is a ton of stuff that public insurance doesn't cover. And the fear is that if you make that distinction blurry by having a facility where some stuff is covered and other stuff isn't covered, Canadians who are used to the idea of going to public hospitals where everything is free might get manipulated by dodgy clinic workers into buying extra services not covered by their insurance that they don't actually need. As one columnist wrote the other day, that could mean costly lenses for cataract patients or eventually deluxe replacement parts for hips and knees. An ailing person under pressure to get surgery is an easy mark for high pressure sales tactics, especially if a private facility offers to accelerate the process on the condition that the patient forks over some cash for so-called Enhanced care? This is what two-tiered medicine looks like. Two-tiered healthcare is another one of the great slogans of Canadian healthcare politics. It is usually a pejorative term referring to the idea that the rich shouldn't be allowed to buy themselves into a higher tier of medical care. But I guess in this context, it's referring to the idea that the speed or quality of care that one receives should never be contingent on the payment of money in any fashion. Then there is a more generalized criticism towards an expanded role for the private sector in the Canadian healthcare system that just sees this whole conversation as a bit of a red herring. The real root cause of all of these terrible wait times and all of that, these critics say, is just that the government isn't funding hospitals enough. Give them the money they need and the problem will solve itself. Ford actually felt the need to genuflect to this position a bit, making a big show about how he is also pumping plenty of fresh funds into the public healthcare facilities. We've invested over $300 million in hospitals for more surgeries, as well as MRI and CT scans. This actually tends to be the standard political response whenever problems with the state of Canadian healthcare are observed. Politicians simply assure the public that increasing funding is the only response that is being considered. But that's a pretty cowardly position, and one that is tied to a larger cycle of cowardice that too often dominates any conversation about Canadian healthcare, which Jeffrey Simpson summarizes quite well in his book. It is easier politically to let silence around the collateral damage of healthcare spending rising relentlessly at rates above provincial revenues. Provincial governments do not want to raise taxes fearing public reaction. They do not want to open the door to more private healthcare spending fearing public reaction. They do not want to explain the impact of healthcare spending on the rest of their budgets fearing public reaction. So they press on seeking efficiencies wherever possible, rearranging models of healthcare administration, making constant announcements about new healthcare spending, because that is what the public wants. While the share of healthcare spending rises in their budgets every year without any of them knowing how to contain it on a sustained basis. So that is basically the best quick summary I can give you about Canadian healthcare. The system is quite complicated, poorly understood, and bound up in a lot of political controversies. But what I think is also worth emphasizing is that it remains broadly popular despite it all. As we have hopefully seen, most of the controversies about the system are tied to fears that the status quo might be disrupted in some way, which reflects the reality that Canadians generally like the status quo and want it to continue. The issue, however, is that the status quo might not be financially or logistically sustainable in the long term, making some kinds of reforms necessary. Yet at the same time, much of the Canadian public has grown so ultra-defensive about keeping everything exactly the way it is, even to the point of having their whole national identity bound up in it, 
that only the bravest of politicians dares to wade into this arena proposing to shake things up. Doug Ford is not exactly a man known for political bravery, but in doing what he has done on this front, he certainly seems gutsier than most.